good evening everybody meeting after span of two three days we will start with our session of organon we were discussing regarding the third chapter from the genetic end that is related with the third aphorism from the sixth edition of organon of medicine where the qualities of homeopathic physicians are added explained the qualities of homeopathic physicians are most important because on the basis of which he has to practice the homeopathy and that's why all those qualities which he tried to explain over there are explained from his point of view by JTK. Hanuman have explained regarding the six important qualities, out of which first one was that the <coughs> knowledge of disease from indication. Number two, knowledge of medicinal powers. Number three, choice of the remedy, the medicine indicated. Number four, the proper dose. Number five, the repetition of the dose. And number six is the obstacles in the process of recovery. So these are very important entities which one, one must not forget. And these are explained by him in his own way. So he tried his level way to explain exactly what Hanuman wants to explain through this quality. So he explained first quality that one must know what is exactly knowledge of disease and how it has been expressed through the patient as an indication. So what are the curative indications? Those are different and disease per disease, you know, original disease, diagnostic pathological disease is different. And both of them are necessary. The first one is necessary to understand exactly what disease, from what disease the patient is suffering from. And second part of it is necessary in order to understand the remedy, the individualization that is through the curative indication. And that part we have discussed thoroughly early in earlier lecture. Second important thing he has mentioned over there that in, in cases of the, specifically in epidemic cases, how one should work out. One has to follow the logic, which is deductive logic. logic. He has to go from the generals to the particulars. And he has mentioned the process of anamnesis, that is the analysis and evaluation of the symptoms, how one can, one can work out. So he has to see many patients who are suffering from the similar epidemic. Then he has to write it down what are the symptoms which are specific for that disease and one of the symptoms which are specific for that individual. So once he start writing down those symptoms and in front of them, whatever the remedies he has prescribed, he comes ultimately, after seeing 20 to 30 cases, he comes to the conclusion of a totality, which is the epidemic totality. And that epidemic totality, which he, he used to get, on the basis of that, he can come to the closure of group of five to six remedy. Many times, you can get a remedy out of them for the patient. But it doesn't mean that your approach is like that. You are ultimately, whenever any patient comes, your approach should be the same. That is, you have to deal with the patient individually for the case of uh, treating him. Only to, if you get a genus epidemicus out of that, that can be only preventive, not a curative remedy. Genus epidemicus is used to prevent the disorder for the healthy persons or even though if they suffer, that will not cause a damage to their health so much. So that is genus epidemicus and genus epidemicus is only for the preventive purpose, not for the curative purpose. So we have come, we are discussing that process and still it is not complete. So we'll continue with the same. If the physician does not work this scheme out on paper, he must do it in mind. So he explained that this method, one should go and follow. So he has mentioned that method on paper, you write down symptoms, etc. But if you are busy and not possible, at least you logically do it in your mind. But if he comes very busy and sees a large number of cases, it will be too much to carry in the mind. You will be astonished to find that if you put an epidemic on paper, you will forever, forever be able to carry the knowledge of it in mind. So if you go on writing down all those details over there, you can immediately catch what are the features of that specific epidemic and it will be easy for you to understand that epidemic in a proper manner. See, this is very important. He is, he is giving you or telling you exactly how one should work out during the epidemic. I have done this and I have been surprised to find 
that after a dozen references to it, I did not need it anymore. So when he has mentioned that I have done same work, and because of which my work becomes simple, to come to reach to the semi lemma becomes simple because of this method, and this method one should work out. Then he further says, now you may say, how is this in regard to the typhoid fever? It is not a new disease. It is an old form. The old practitioner has unconsciously made an anamnesis of his typhoid cases. He has unconsciously written it out in his mind and carries it out around. It is not difficult to work out the group of typhoid remedies and from the, this group he works. The same is true with regard to the measles. Certain remedies correspond to the nature of measles. That is when studied by its symptoms and not by the name. So what he is explaining? He is explaining that this anamnesis gives you a therapeutic thought in your mind. It clears the idea. For example, you are thinking about typhoid. Then you find it out what are the symptoms of the typhoid one by one. Catch them typhoid features from different peoples and then find it out which remedy on the basis of symptomatology which will give a better idea about the typhoid. Same is true with related with the measles. Instead of finding it out the word measles, you find it out what are the symptoms of measles during an epidemic. Write it down one by one symptomatology, the common symptomatology and uncommon symptomatology. With common symptomatology, you get the measles totality. And with on the basis of that totality, you can get a genus epidemicus or group of remedies which are useful as a preventive in genus epidemicus. This will not give you directly a remedy for the patient, but it will show you, create in your mind a thought regarding certain group of remedies. Of course, every now and then will come up a rare singular case, which will compel you to go outside of usual of the usual group. Never allow yourself to be so cramped that you can, cannot go outside of the medicine that you have settled upon as medicine, say for measles. So he's explaining if you have get uh, the group of remedies, five or six remedies, and then after getting four or five or six remedies, and if you are treating patients and they are doing wonderfully work, one of the case comes where these six remedies are not coming one of the remedy which is absolutely indicating something else. Then what he says, you must go outside that group of it. Whatever may be the similar one, that is of first priority. Prescribe that. So whether it is measles case, whether it is scarlet fever case, whether it is typhoid case, whatever it may be. All your non-descript cases, of course, will get pulsatilla because it is so similar to the nature of measles. But it does not do to be too limited or routine. But be sure in administering a remedy that the indications are clear. Every busy practitioner thinks of Elianthus, Apis, Belladonna and Sulphur for malignant cases of scarlet fever and eight he has often to go outside of that group. So when we study the Materia Medica, the thought develops in our mind. Belladonna is a very good remedy for measles fever. Elianthus is very good remedy. Or he has mentioned about the apis is the good remedy. Yes, this thought comes. But it is. it does not mean that you should prescribe these remedies only. Ultimately, your prescription is based upon what the patient is indicating. What is the curative indication in that patient on the basis of which you can find it out a right remedy. So this is too important that you have to go outside of this group. Don't fix the idea. So measles, belladonna. Don't think like that. So the physician perceives in the disease what is that constitutes the curative indication. So underline curative indication. He is explaining every time curative indication. Curative indications means indications which are individualizing the patient. This present it presents itself to his mind only when he is clearly conversant with the nature of the sickness, as for instance, with the nature of scarlet fever, of measles, of typhoid fever, the zymosis. Zymosis, zymosis means the process by which the infection, infectious disease is supposed to be developed. That is called a zymosis. The zymosis, the blood changes, etc. So that when they are arrived, he is not surprised. 
When the typhoid state progresses, he expects tympanitic abdomen, the diarrhea, the continued fever, the rash, the delirium, and unconsciousness. So when you know the disease properly, you get exactly the idea of what it what is its pathogenesis, what may be the signs and symptoms, what may be the complication, how the disease will going to progress whether we are on right track or whether we are wrong, wrong track, everything we can get on the basis of that. For that purpose, knowledge of disease is very important. These things stand out as a nature of typhoid. These things stand out as nature of typhoid. When therefore he goes to the Matra Medica, he at once calls up before his mind this nature of typhoid and so is able to pick out the remedies that have the same such a nature. He sees the phosphorus, the rust, the bryonia, the baptisia, the arsenicum, etc. Low forms of fever corresponding to the typhoid condition. But when the patient jumps away or jumps away out of the ordinary group of remedies, then it is that he has to go outside the beaten tract and find another remedy that also corresponds to the nature of typhoid fever. So here he clearly mentions that you should not become rigid with the fixed remedy. Yes, you can get a group of remedies with the help of name of the disease or its presentation. But many a times you have to go beyond because ultimately you have to find it out the remedy on the basis of curative indications, not on the common indication. So curative indications are always individualistic and that, that remedy might be sometimes different. <laughs> So I have seen that I have treated typhoid in a child who is typically a sena, presenting total sena. So it has been not mentioned over there, typhoid in sena, but still sena work because, because the remedy we have to we have to prescribe for the patient and not for his fever. We don't have to depend our treatment on the name of the diseases. By these remarks, I am endeavoring, endeavoring to prayatna karne, trying trying, endeavoring. By these remarks, I am endeavoring to hold up before you what the physician regards as curative indications of disease. First, he sees the disease in general as to its nature. And then, when an individual has this disease, this individual will present in his own peculiarities the peculiar features of that, of that disease. The homeopathy is in the habit of studying the slightest shades of difference between the patients, the little thing that point to the remedy. So every patient, patient, patient presents to you with a similar diagnosis. Might be there are 10 patients of typhoid fever are there in your opinion. But everyone having a different shade. And many a times, some features are common, which are related with the typhoid, they are common. But everyone presents it in a different manner. In some patients, it is a continuous type of fever. In some patients, it might be increasing high, then it reaches to the little bit high up more than a little bit up than the normal, then it again increases. There might be a time modality, there might be associated concomitant. All those things differentiates one individual of typhoid from the another individual of the typhoid. And these are very minor differences which you have to carry out. Some patients might be thirsty, some patients might be thirstless. Some patients require thirst, there is a thirst for small quantities at frequent intervals. Some patients, it might be a large quantity at long intervals. It is very old. Variations are there. So you have to find it out, those variations which are called to be a curative, remedy, curative indications for the remedy. And this is very important, not the common symptoms of the disease. And this is what he is explaining over there. If we look on this is only as the old school physician sees it. The homeopathy is in the habit of studying the slightest shades of difference between patients, the little thing that point to the remedy. If we looked upon this is only to the old school only as an old school physician sees it, we would have no means of distinction. But it is because of little peculiarities manifested by every individual patient through his inner life, through everything he thinks, that the homeopath is enabled to individualize. So, we'll take an example. If a patient comes to you with typhoid fever, diagnosed case of typhoid fever, 
and patient is having severe body ache, he is in toxic state, his tongue is brown coated and if you check his temperature, it is 104 degrees Fahrenheit and his pulse is 100. Another patient comes who is again in a toxic state, uh, diagnosed case of typhoid, where tongue is quite clear and his temperature is 100 and his pulse is 140. Both of them are having body ache. Both of them are having weakness. But difference is there. What is that difference? Which That is that differentiation is called as anamnesis, Sharo. This is what is anamnesis. You have to differentiate one patient from another patient on the basis of certain characteristics. You have to understand that differentiation is called as the process is called as an anamnesis. So for first patient, what is the remedy which you are going to prescribe? For the first patient, you are going to prescribe back tissue shea because there is a relative bradycardia. According to the temperature, there is no increase in pulse. So if we consider 98 with the 80 pulse, 99, 90 pulse, 100, 100 pulse. But with this patient, there is 104 temperature and pulse is 100. It is a relative bradycardia. This is what is a bacteria with a brownish coating on the tongue. Exactly opposite, clean coated tongue with toxic state where the relative tachycardia temperature is only 100 but pulse is very high, pyrogen. So we have to do this. This is very important. This is what is called as an anamnesis. We have to catch that from the patient. That is that is the curative indication, not the body ache, not the weakness, not the toxic state, because those are common. We have to differentiate on the basis of that. If the physician clearly perceives what is curative in medicines, that is to say, in each visual medicine, here again, he progresses from general to particular. He cannot become acquainted clearly with the action of action of the medicines individually until he becomes acquainted with the action of medicine collectively, proceeding from collective study to a particular. This is to be done by studying proving. Suppose we have to start on this class and make a proving of some known drug, unknown drug. It would be expected that you would you would all bring out the same symptom. But the same general features would run through this class of provers. Each individual would have his own peculiarity. Number one, might bring out symptoms of the mind more clearly than number two. Number two, might bring out symptoms of the bowels more clearly than number one. Number three, might bring out the head symptoms very strongly, etc. Now, if these were collected together as if one man had proved the medicine, we would then have an image of that medicine. If we had 100 provers, we would go through the whole nature of this remedy and perceive how it affected the human race and how it acted as a unit. So here, one, one important thing one has to understand. What he explained? He explained that you have to prove this remedy and you have to prove it hundreds of rovers where they are of different ages, both sexes. Then it should be given in different times. It should be given in different places with different potencies. So you can get a whole data. Some patients give the mild symptoms, some patients give the head symptoms, some patients give the GI symptoms, some patients give the symptoms related with the joint. And a whole data which you will collect will define you the remedy. But you can get the knowledge regarding the powers. If you would have given the 30 potency to one patient, you can find it out that 30, how he has reacted. For another patient, you would have given the 200, then you might have understood how the person has reacted to 200. This is what is the understanding of knowledge of medicinal powers. One must understand this. And that's why remedy you get in total. In general, so for example, weather is going on regarding the rust ox. Rust ox, yes, definitely it is rust weather. But every patient requires it in different potency. Someone might require it in 6, someone might require it 30, 200, 1M, 10M, 50M. It depends, varies from person to person. And that's why every potency works as a different remedy in different potency. So every remedy in, in 6, 30, 200, 1M, 10M, 50M, same. It's a different remedy. And that powers one has to understand. That if you catch, then it becomes simple to treat. Then you, you get a very early result. 
what he says further, what I have said before about studying the nature of disease must be applied to the study of nature of remedy. So when you study a disease in the similar manner, you have to study the remedy. You have to do a writing work. You have to find it out what is common, what is uncommon. So you, if 100% symptoms are, there are 10 symptoms which are proved by all 100% provers, then they are grade 3. There are 50% uh, provers have shown certain features, then they are, they become grade 2. There are some features which are proved by one or two provers only, they are grade 3. So you have to give the grading, then marks. This is very important. This is called as an anamnesis. So that you can understand the case and you can understand the action of a remedy in such a manner properly. A remedy is in condition to be studied as a whole when it is on paper. The mind symptoms under one head, the symptoms of the scalp under the another, and so on throughout the entire body in accordance, accordance with animal schema. We may go on adding to it, developing it, and noting which of the symptoms of, or groups of symptoms are most prominent. A remedy is not fully proved until it has permeated and made sick all regions of the body. When it has done, it is ready for study and for use. Many of our proofs, many of our proofs are only fragments and are given in the books for which, for what they are worth. Hanuman followed up in full all the remedies that he handled, uh, handed down to earth. In these, the symptoms have been brought out upon the entire man. The individual medicine must be studied in that way as to how it changes the human race. So, Hanuman is proving is a wonderful proving. If you read the Matra uh, Medica Pura, where you can get directly the proving symptoms done by Hanuman, you can get a thorough knowledge how he how hard work he has done. Because of which, the polycrest which you are using, it is only because of the hard work done by Hanuman. We get a ready-made data which collect which is collected by Hanuman at that time. And thorough provings were made by him to write to understand action on each and every part of the world. And that's why whatever the remedies he has proved, he has proved 99 remedies in his lifetime. This is only one person in the history of medicine who has worked 99 remedies proving. So he has the same work you have to do over here. You have to write down differentiated symptoms from mind, the head, the throat according to the anatomical schema. That means according to the repertory, the, in the way the repertory is chapters are arranged, that is according to the anatomical schema. So that you can understand exactly where the, there is the focus of the remedy, where it acts strongly, in which part it acts strongly, so that you can get the thorough knowledge. There are many medicines in our Matra Medica which are not fully proved. But still, we can get a big idea because the action is specifically mentioned. For example, if we go through the Ornithogallon, having a direct action on the pyloric end of the stomach. And that's why it is a very good remedy for pyloric stenosis, pyloric spasms, wonderful remedy. So that, that defines specifically the site of action. And that's why we can understand the depth of the remedy. It is also good for the cancer. So ornithogallum is a very good cancer remedy also. Cancer of stomach, it is a wonderful remedy. So we get this on the basis of that. And that's why the study of the remedies in similar manner as we study the disease is necessary. This is what he says. And to conclude the chapter, there are only two paragraphs. We have to finish in two-day session. To understand the nature of the chronic myelom, sora, syphilis, psychosis, the homeopath must proceed in, in identically the same way as with the acutes. Hanuman has put on paper the image of sora. For 11 years, he collected symptoms of those patients who were undoubtedly sorry and arranged them in schematic form until the nature of this great myelom become apparent. Following upon that, he published antisoric remedies, which in their nature have a similarity to the Sora. Here, the word antisoric is single word. Antisoric means not opposite to Sora. It is one word similar to Sora. If you put a dash in between, it is called as opposite sister. It is one word, antisoric. It is written very correctly, antisoric. If there is a dash in your book, 
remove that dash. Following upon that, the, uh, he published anti-soric remedies, which in their nature have a similar similarity to Sora. To be really successful physician, the homeopath must proceed along the same lines in regard to the syphilis and psychosis. He is explaining the way how one must study. If you want to understand myism, just go on doing this hard work. Write down symptomatology. What are the symptoms of Sora? What are the symptoms of Sora in head? What are the symptoms of Sora in throat, mouth, and according to the There was a little bit dis problem, internet problem. That's why it was discontinued. Let us continue with it. So what he is explaining? He is explaining that if you want to be a successful physician, what you have to do is nothing but just do a hard work. Find it out all those things. Write it down in a proper manner so that you can get all those things very clearly. And to conclude this chapter, what he explained. Now when the physician sees, as it were, in an image, the nature of disease, when he is acquainted with every disease to which we are subject, and when we see the nature, we see the nature of the remedies in common use, just as clearly as he pursues disease, then on listening to the symptoms of the sick man, he knows instantly the remedies that have produced upon healthy man symptoms similar to these. This is what paragraph three teaches. It looks towards me making the homeopathic physician so intelligent that when he goes to the bedside of patient, he can clearly perceive the nature of disease and nature of the remedy. It is a matter of perception he sees with his understanding. When a physician understands the nature of disease and of the remedies, then it is that he will be skillful. See, very nicely has concluded the chapter. He says that this is what the important thing the physician must know. The physician must know what exactly the nature of disease is. He must know what exactly the nature of remedy is, medicine is. And then if it is so, you are acquainted with both knowledges, then at the bedside you just observe the patient. So then it clicks your mind very easily. I have seen my one of my close relative who was admitted in ICU and Doctor has declared that there is very less chance that he will come out and he was absolutely in drowsy state and I just got went over there to meet him and when I entered in ICU he was like this. He was like that and he was kept, he was on that what prop up condition it was kept but he was sliding down. It was there. This is what the prescribing point is. This is what I catch. I talk, I talk with doctor, the, who the physician is. He said, sir, give the homeopathy. No problem. If he survives, credit goes to you. And I just observed what is the thing. I observed that this is the state of picric acid. So I have collected picric acid and immediately put, given it through the rice tube and after eight days, this fellow came out of unconsciousness after giving picric acid within four or five hours. He recovered thereafter and still he is alive. This has happened 10 years back. So this is this is the importance. You, you catch all those things. Yes, what is that? Which is indicating exactly the patient's state. It is not picric acid, sorry. It is muriatic acid, which I have prescribed. It was not picric. It, just, it is muriatic acid. And muriatic acid is having that very specific thing. If you open the alleins, you will get that sentence over there and you can get muriatic acid over there. So I have given muriatic acid and patient recovered so nicely. So if you are thorough with the knowledge of medicines, you have, if you are thorough with the knowledge of diseases, and curative indication, then you can apply, you can utilize the remedy. I have given the muriatic acid in 200 potency to that fellow and in through the rice tube I have put it in a um, dissolved in a water. And the patient came out. 
it was a wonderful thing even the doctor the physician who called me after some time and he said it is great it goes to homeopathy not to the allopathy because we are treating him since last week and he was not coming out of unconsciousness so this is this is what homeopathy is there and that's the thing which he has mentioned over there in the third aphorism the part of it he has mentioned over there there are few points which are still remaining that he has continued in the chapter number 4 so tomorrow we'll start with the lecture number 4 from the from this kent's philosophy so we have finished the three chapters the wonderful explanation about the aphorisms what kent has made and that that is the idea the philosophy gives you exactly what hanuman wanted to tell you so we have to learn that aspects which is more practical and which is more useful in day to day practice so that's all for today we'll meet at 9:30 with new remedy the simple item in today's session uh, it will be a fish for all of you to learn the simple item ask everyone to join all of your friends Uh, i have not yet posted the poster i will send it immediately so you can share it with your friends and ask them to join at 9:30 sharp with new remedy the simple item officially again a remedy for injury so thank you being there and we'll meet at 9:30 thanks a lot